much. I'm really glad to get to be here today with you and share with you a journey that I'm on. It's a long one. And the further down I go, the more I continue to degrade and erode something that all of us have and that I have. But contrary to what you might be thinking, it is not my voice. Rather, it's my image of what I think is possible to do with the voice and my image of what I think is possible to do with the body. Now, I'm a beatboxer to start with. And for those of you that might not know, uh, beatboxing is the art of making drum noises with your voice, with your mouth, with the organic instrument that all of us do have. Beatboxing is one of the actual five elements of hip hop culture, the other four elements if you're uninformed. Uh, DJing with turntables, MCing, rapping, b-boying or breakdancing, which we got to see pieces of earlier in the conference, and graffiti writing. Now, beatboxing is a wonderfully natural thing in that it comes out of a really simple need to have a beat when you don't have one. If you don't have a boom box or if you don't have an actual electronic beatbox, that system that makes the beats we know and love, uh, somebody's got to be the human beatbox, and so somebody's going to have to take a microphone and start making drum noises. Now, beatboxing is a wonderful art, and I love it because it's comprised of everything that you've got up here. We walk around with it all day. Rather than humming while I do tasks, I often actually beatbox, which my colleagues will attest to. There's a little more spit on my desk than other people's desks. Um, <laughs> But I recently started to think about it a little bit differently. And it actually came out of a conversation I had with a friend of mine. Uh, I had found out recently that he was a musician. And I said, oh, you're a musician. That's terrific. What, what do you play? And he said, ah, play is kind of a, a generous term. I, I wouldn't even call myself a musician. I, I'm more of a saxophone owner operator. <laughs> and I thought this was hilarious. And it started me thinking about beatboxing, because beatboxing at its best can move completely outside the expectations that you have about what's possible to do with a voice, with a throat, and with a mouth. Um, and those performances can be really captivating. But the funny thing was, I started to recognize that I myself was more of a, a voice owner operator, a, a body owner operator, traveling around in this body of mine, sometimes doing beatboxing performances moving outside of your own expectations of what's possible, but without even understanding what was actually going on inside. I didn't really understand what was going on behind, and this is the journey that I'm on now, is using technology to the best that it becomes available to me to redefine what I think is possible to do. And so, of course, where do you go if you want to learn more about what's behind uh, the ability to create music? You go to Charles Lim. So if we could play the video. So we're here in the fMRI scanner with Nate Ball, who's just doing some beatboxing for us. He's up there in the scanner. Nate, you want to say hi to the camera? Hey, hey, how's it going? What are you doing in there for us? I am beatboxing inside of an fMRI so we can see what's actually happening inside my brain. Good, we're going to look a little more close up now. Go ahead and do that control beat for us that you just uh, had been repeating. Yeah, you bet. This is Brick House. It was, it, was the me, it was the me from the past. So what we were doing was trying to examine the difference between uh, doing a memorized beat, which is the beat that was Brick House, which 
was one of the first ones that I learned, and so it's heavily ingrained in my memory. It's almost on muscle memory. It's like sitting down at the piano, playing the first piece that you learned. And that one sounds like Now, rather than just use the expression, I could do that in my sleep, I sometimes have woken up actually having been doing that in my sleep. But we wanted to see the difference between a really heavily memorized, memorized beat and what happens when we're getting creative. And so, Charles, if you could talk about what we actually saw. So there actually was a scientific method to this madness. Um, I, I'm getting a reputation for doing kooky science, and I, I want to be careful. <laughs> so <laughs> so y when Nate was beatboxing, again, he was in the scanner lane, perfectly still using a fiber optic noise canceling microphone. He had intense activation in auditory structures, motor structures, and you can see that right here when he did a memorized beat. Now watch what happens when you go from memorized beat to creative beatboxing. So you have an enhancement and robust intensification of this whole neural network that's involved in beatboxing a creative beat. This gets to the idea that you can isolate or subtract out creativity. And so what you do is you actually do a subtraction. And here we can see relative increases. What changed, what went up when you were improvising, and also what went down when you were improvising. And you can render that three-dimensionally like this. And so this is, in fact, Nate's brain activity during improvised versus memorized beatboxing. And what we see is intense cerebellar activity when he was improvising, intense sensory motor cortices, temporal lobe activity, and also a shutdown in a portion of his right prefrontal cortex. Now, this is, uh, at least as far as single subject goes, I know that this is Nate's brain's data. I don't know how it would be for 10 other beatboxers. However, this is a pretty intriguing explanation for how he's able to improvise by shutting down a portion of his prefrontal cortex, things that are involved in self-monitoring, and ramping up other parts of his neural networks. Thanks so much. <laughs> Appreciate that, Charles. And the other thing that I found really interesting, too, was one of the other comparisons we did was between simple speech and simple beatboxing. And in fact, there was very little difference to be seen between simple speech and simple beatboxing. And that really makes sense to me, in fact. Beatboxing is one of the most natural things that I can imagine a person doing. We're rhythmic beings through and through. We walk in rhythm, we breathe in rhythm, our hearts beat in rhythm, and every single day we make crazy noises with our mouths. I think it's something we totally take for granted, but every single day you go through an incredibly wide range of sounds that you make with your mouth and with your voice. Uh, a woman giggling will sometimes hit a higher pitch than the highest that a soprano might sing in an aria. At the same time, a sneeze that you would do could be a bigger explosion of noise and a lower tone than any kind of kick drum noise I would be making up here on stage. Now, this was hilariously illustrated to me in a little thing that went around the internet recently, and it was called The Simplest Instructions for Beatboxing. Now, it simplifies what I think is an incredible art form down to an almost embarrassing level, but it offers a really nice explanation for how natural this is and how some of the more really captivating beatboxing performances actually work. Now, I want to do this together, and I'll do it first so you're all familiar with it, and then you can do like I often do, which is suppress the parts of the prefrontal cortex that are having to do with self-monitoring. Um, <laughs> I'm doing it, I'm making the weird noises, you guys can too, and we'll do it together. All you've got to do to beatbox simply is repeat two things back and forth, two words. One is boots, and the other is cats. Boots, cats, boots, cats, boots, cats. There we go, boots, cats, keep it going, boots, cats. Boots, cats, boots, cats, boots, cats, cats, boots, cats, boots, cats, boots, cats, cats, boots, cats, boots, cats, cats. That was fantastic. You guys are all beatboxers. <laughs> Round of applause for yourself. Thank you for that. We're all beatboxers, and just some of us put a little more kick drum into our boots than others, but now you all know. Um, and I think this is really thrilling, and seeing my brain actually on beatboxing was fascinating to me. And what we began to learn really opens up some interesting questions about creativity in general. But I also, I'm an engineer, and I wanted to know more about the actual nuts and bolts of what's going on inside. Now, everybody knows that bass is a really key part of, of hip-hop music, right? 
we heard the difference in the Usher track, where the cochlear implants can't pick up that full range of frequencies and, and bring it into the brain. And uh, it really takes the soul out of it. And I think understanding that totally explains for all of us why uh, the Chipmunks Hip Hop Christmas album is still underperforming in sales. Um, <laughs> so as a beatboxer, if you want to make good sounding bass noises, if you're limited by your vocal vocal folds and, and how low you can sing, this thing down here, this isn't going to be bumping out of any clubs. You've got to really get low. And so what I began to do was emulate other beatboxes I was hearing and try to teach myself how to get the tones lower than my vocal cords could actually go. And what I started to hear was this growl. And you hear it sometimes in blues music when somebody's, oh, I'm singing about I'm so sad. There's that little accentuation to it. Well, you can separate that out and train yourself to growl on tone. It sounds like this. And when you do that at the same time as making a vocal pitch, which to me felt like two separate things, that's when you get right here and lock onto that thing that makes that robot voice. Now that added in a little more of the bass tone that I was looking for. <laughs> And then, <laughs> thanks. Well, then I started to think I can actually control these things a little bit separately because it feels like I'm doing two different things at the same time. I wondered if I could actually get two things to separate a little bit, control them independently. And so I started playing with it a bit more and I started to hear things like which is actually two pitches at the same time that's singing a fifth with myself, something I would never have thought was possible. But I started to get a little worried because in doing some of this bass training stuff, I would occasionally <coughs> break into fits of violent coughing, which didn't seem like the best thing to keep pursuing. And based on the model of what I understood my voice could do, I had vocal folds down there that were vibrating to make a tone. And I thought what was happening was they were vibrating at two separate frequencies, kind of like you might be able to make a rope swing do, and a speaker vibrates at many frequencies at once. I thought the vocal cords were flapping around to make the low pitch, and then somehow also vibrating at a different pitch. I needed to see what was going on. I needed to find out more about the nuts and bolts. And this is what I found really interesting. It opened up some possibilities, and I wanted to take you all through this rather intimate journey together today. So I'm gonna need a little bit extra assistance. Thanks again to Quinn and Charles, who are going to help us out with this. So I was all set to perform a laryngoscopy on Nate on stage until I found out that I don't have a California medical license. <laughs> <laughs> and so not wanting to commit malpractice on TED, <laughs> we are fortunate to have Dr. Quinn Nguyen, who's an otolaryngologist also. And so what Nate has already had his nasal passages numbed up prior to coming up, which is really impressive that he could speak that way. What we're going to do now is thread a fiber optic laryngoscope through his, na through his nasal cavity on the right and position it right in the nasopharynx, right over his larynx, so we can see what's going on. And we're going to first show you some basic things that happen during phonation. Now, keep in mind, the purpose of the larynx, the minimum functions, to protect the airway during swallowing and to phonate. That's why we have a voice box. We can never understand how a vocal artist does what he does if we just think about minimal function. And so this is what this is all about here. The defog ray. Yeah. Now I can't lie, these images look a little different from when you see still images of the inside of the body. So if you're squeamish, uh, feel free to focus just on my face, focus on the floor in front of you. I encourage you, though, to be bold and go along on this little trip. Uh, it's going to be fun. <laughs> so right now, the, the, the right nasal passage is going to be cannulated. Here we go. There it is, and that is a clean nose, ladies and gentlemen. Right. So we're going back to the nasopharynx right now, and we're going to zoom down. That's the back of the throat. There is the larynx, okay? 
Now, Hello. the epiglottis is that flap of tissue that's sort of towards the bottom of the screen. You can see the vocal cords in the middle as a V shape. Those things holding next to the vocal cords are the arytenoid cartilages. So, Nate, first thing we're going to have you do is just breathe normally. And now we're going to have you say, E, E. Okay. okay, so you see the vocal cords vibrating. That's what we do. Now, go ahead and swallow. When he swallows, <laughs> what happens is the larynx raises itself and the epiglottis drops to cover the airway to protect it. Now we're going to have you go ahead and speak. Hello. Now we're doing this together, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hello. So this thing can do a lot. And when I first saw this image, I got to go to the Boston University Medical Center in their otolaryngology department. It's an entirely different kind of visual feedback to have because <laughs> <laughs> when somebody tells you do this with your throat, you get to see what happens. Now, <clears throat> swallowing, yes. Um, the first thing I wanted to do was see what was actually happening when I was doing this growl tone. And uh, you might see on my right side, it's your left on the screen, the arytenoid is a lot more developed. And what we found was, when I made the robot, uh, robot noise, it went like this. <laughs> That's not the vocal cords. <laughs> and when I do the, the growl tone, at the same time as actually sing, it looks more like this. <laughs> And the reason that's popping back and forth is because they're vibrating at actually different frequencies. You're seeing visual aliasing because of the frame rate of the strobe in there. If we could see down in between the arytenoids, you could see also my voice boxing. So, ah, excuse my swallowing again. <laughs> this is where things really changed my model. It wasn't actually the vocal cords vibrating at two different frequencies. Uh, it was two separate things vibrating. That's what was giving me that low bass tone. And thinking about that, I thought, oh, there's plenty of other things in my body that I can vibrate at different frequencies to make low tones. <laughs> now, I'm still working on the other throat ones, but the first place I actually went was the lips. And then also the tongue. This one took more practice, but... And then the bass started getting a little lower. Just, if you guys are cool with doing this for a little bit longer, I want to show one more piece of. <laughs> thank you. I want to show one more, one more piece of uh, performance that really captured my imagination and enthrallment because it was taking these simple beatboxing pieces that we did with boots and cats, words with extra emphasis on the on the beat noises, to seem like you were doing two things at the same time, and that's the classic doing a beat and singing at the same time. And I'm feeling rather overstimulated from all this, and so I thought some good words could be, uh, overstimulated in the best way, for sure, uh, but overstimulated. So I wanted to do the, the, the song, I'm, my mind is feeling overstimulated while I did a beat behind it, uh, while you guys got to see what was happening inside. And so we'll just do a simple beat. My mind is overstimulated. 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 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm really grateful to you guys for going along on that journey with me. To my knowledge, that Thanks. was the first time uh, the inside of the body has ever been shown, at least in a beatboxing performance. But the thought that I wanted to leave with was, uh, what if instead of body owner operators, uh, we instead chose to inhabit these incredible machines uh, that we all get to live in as instruments uh, capable of amazing beauty. Um, the possibilities are endless. <laughs>